Over the course of these demonstrations of the past uh, three months, um, the struggle has been indeed, as, as Feder uh, mentioned, it's been a struggle between uh, corruption on one hand and transparency and the rule of law on the other. Uh, and these protesters have consistently uh, been on the side of what we call European ideals. Uh, and we've more or less been sitting on the sidelines uh, watching this tragedy unfold. And we have as well a, a lot of political spin about these protesters being extremists. Um, we have extremists among uh, the protesters. That's the case with most protests. But the vast majority of these people um, are everyday Ukrainians seeking a better life for themselves. And the EU needs to exact sa sanctions against the Yanukovych regime to, to uh, defend their interests. I think if tomorrow, during an extraordinary session, the EU foreign ministers make a decision and resolve to apply sanctions against the, the president, uh, Viktor Yanukovych, and his political allies in Kyiv, uh, it will be a significant step forward. I think it will show the rest of the country uh, that the international community sees Viktor Yanukovych as being primarily responsible for this escalating violence and will also give cover to a lot of uh, Yanukovych's allies um, to uh, cease falling in line with his orders. Um, these defections are, are very important going forward. Rory Finnan is the director of the Ukrainian Studies Program at the University of Cambridge in Britain, joins us now live from London. Thank you very much for being with us. What do you take on this Russian stance that is legally allowed to be in Crimea and indeed doesn't even have any troops in the region? It's absurd. Uh, Russia has invaded sovereign and independent Ukraine in, in clear and unabashed contravention of international law. It's as simple as that. Uh, the press conference that uh, Vladimir Putin just gave was in a performance of a great deal of incoherence, uh, flat untruths, and, and really bad strategic policy. Uh, Mr. Fennel, we've been watching this standoff in Crimea for most of the day. I mean, it's been pretty incredible to watch uh, the standoff, the, the conversation going on between the two sides. Warning shots were fired, but then everything seemed to calm down. It's very difficult to gauge just how volatile the situation is there. It's extremely volatile. And uh, again, what we have here are Russian troops uh, that uh, Vladimir Putin is projecting as uh, local self-defense forces, which is uh, a mistruth, uh, surrounding Ukrainian military bases and Ukrainian soldiers who are not armed um, and firing warning shots. Uh, essentially, what we're waiting for is the other shoe to drop, a series of provocations that would legitimate more military force, military force between uh, two of Europe's largest countries in a very uh, geopolitically strategic, strategic part of the world here. But I do want to make uh, one point abundantly clear. We often speak in the media of Ukraine as a divided country. We use maps that indicate that Ukraine is divided between, for instance, a pro-EU West and a pro-Russia East. Um, this is a very reductive uh, description of the country. And it's very dangerous right now because if we're under the assumption that half of the country, the so-called pro-Russian part of the country, is going to welcome uh, Russian troops into the south and east and into parts of Crimea, um, we will be sorely mistaken. We will have a bloody and very real war on our hands. So we need to have a more nuanced understanding of Ukraine as we go forward. What do you think Russia's next move is there then? And, and what does it actually want? Honestly, um, I don't think anyone knows the answer to that question. I think the discussion about what the Kremlin wants here is something of a distraction. I think what we really should be doing is focusing on what Ukraine needs. Um, Ukraine here is in a desperate economic situation. What we need to do is offer it an immediate, uh, ambitious Marshall Plan that can put the, f the country back on better financial footing um, so that it can pay state salaries, pay pensions. Essentially, what I believe is going on is an attempt by the Kremlin to destabilize the fledgling government in Kyiv. A lot of us believe that. It's quite clear he wants to foment public uh, unrest. Um, he's fr frankly lying that these uh, troops that are surrounding Ukrainian bases are public self-defense units. That is clearly not true. That's a recognition, implicit recognition, that these are Russian troops uh, illegally uh, within the sovereign boundaries of, of an independent country. Well, in order to get a better idea of how identity is playing a role in the current situation, I'm joined now by Rory Finnan in London. He's the director of Ukrainian studies at the University of Cambridge. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Finnan. Uh, we just shared that fascinating insight into how Russians view Ukraine, but help us gain some insight into how Crimeans view Russia and, and their relations with, with that country. I guess what I'm getting at is why would Crimeans want to vote to join Russia? 
It's a very good question. Um, first of all, we have to understand that this vote is illegitimate for a number of reasons. This is not a referendum in the traditional sense of the word. I, I actually don't think the term is appropriate here at all. Um, why the uh, Crimeans who wish to join Russia would vote um, under circumstances in which, for instance, uh, military troops um, are uh, from from Russia are surveying the situation um, in a hastily organized uh, referendum, um, which is not being monitored by official EU and OSCE bodies, uh, which is being directed by a man with uh, Sergei Aksyonov, who has a very uh, small and marginal profile. Uh, in Crimea, his uh, party, Russian Nationalist Party, had only a few seats in the regional legislature. So it's very difficult to understand what Russians and what Crimeans really want in a circumstance that's so tainted by this military intervention. The second, uh, Crimea as a peninsula is a very multi-ethnic peninsula. There's no ethnic claim to be had here in such a multi-ethnic territory. Mm -hmm. um, if we do pursue a ethnic claim, um, then the Crimea should belong to the indigenous Crimean Tatars, who, by the way, um, oppose this vote and oppose this military occupation. Um, this is not to say, though, that the views of Crimeans um, who would prefer uh, uh, union with Russia are illegitimate feelings, but we need to give them and respect their feelings within a context and a legal framework um, that recognizes every single member and every single citizen of the peninsula, the Autonomous Republic, uh, Autonomous Republic of Crimea, and in fact, um, the citizens of Ukraine as a whole. Keep in mind that the Article 73 of the Ukrainian Constitution is very clear on this issue. Any change to Ukraine's territory is subject to an all-Ukrainian referendum. Uh, the Autonomous Republic of Crimea in Ukraine has its own constitution, which derives its power from the Ukrainian constitution. So this is very clearly illegal. Let's give everyone a chance to express their political views, but do it in the correctly uh, jurisprudential framework. The expectation is that the majority of people on the Crimean Peninsula will vote to join Russia. That is the expectation. This is considered to be a foregone conclusion by many. What impact would such a shift have on relations between various ethnic groups there on the Crimean Peninsula? A profound impact. Keep in mind that the ultimate objective here is not Crimea itself. The Kremlin is trying to destabilize Ukraine as a whole, and particularly the fledgling government in Kiev. It is doing this through stage provocations, uh, particularly in the south and east, in cities like Kharkiv and Donetsk. Kharkiv, by the way, is where, in the 19th century, uh, the modern Ukrainian national idea was effectively born. At the moment, we need to be very concerned about Russian troop buildup along the eastern Ukrainian border, and the fact that Russia appears to be uh, ready to invade. Uh, this is, would be an invasion of Europe's largest country into Europe's second largest country. This is an extremely uh, volatile situation, and we here in the West need to understand that Ukrainians in the south and east of their country uh, will defend their country. And we need to make them the subjects of this story a little bit more. Our media discourse needs to be elevated so that we can understand just how gravely this threat is from the Kremlin. Let's bring you more now on our top story, the crisis in Ukraine. And joining us via Skype is Rory Finnan, director of the Ukrainian Studies Program at Cambridge University. Thank you very much for being with us. <clears throat> Excuse me. Perhaps you could help us understand why we are seeing Kiev dithering over these deadlines. Let me begin an answer by way of two numbers, Laura. 10 and 26. 10 for the 10% of respondents in Ukraine's east who wish to secede from Ukraine and join the Russian Federation. 26 for the 26% of respondents in Ukraine's east who wish to see a uh, federalized Ukrainian state. Um, these are numbers from very reputable polls released um, uh, as recently as last week. And I mention them now to place these current events in context. Um, essentially what we are seeing is uh, uh, violence and upheaval that is not supported by the vast majority uh, of Ukraine citizens in the eastern and southern parts of the country. Um, we have to understand that this interim Ukrainian government is attempting to salvage a situation in which its economy is virtually bankrupt, at the same time it's trying to institute a series of reforms in line with EU and IMF loans and financial mm -hmm. guarantees, which is a bit like building an aircraft while you're sitting in a sinking ship. It's extremely difficult to do. At the same time, they're having to contend with these manufactured um, uh, separatist movements in uh, Ukraine's east. Um, Russia does not need to necessarily annex or incorporate Ukraine's east. What it is trying to do is uh, gain leverage against a very weak Ukrainian state. It wants a federalized Ukraine, one which would uh, apportion various regions 
um, roles to conduct their own foreign policy, for instance, all of these would be very conducive to that project of Eurasian Union I mentioned earlier uh, that Vladimir Putin very much uh, wants and has invested a great deal of economic and political capital in. Um, You're currently in Kiev. Tell us what the mood is like there. Good morning. Uh, well, you said the, the, the mood is, is I would say, uh, tense um, in Kiev. Uh, yesterday there was a rehearsal, for instance, for a military parade that will take place tomorrow to mark Ukraine's Independence Day. Um, it took place on Khrushchev, uh, Kiev's central thoroughfare, and featured um, scores of cadets and troops, um, tanks, armed personnel carriers, and the like. And I think pedestrians walking past the scene um, we're largely silent. We have to keep in mind that Ukraine has uh, experienced a lot of trauma over the past year, and the very streets that saw during the Euromaidan revolution scores of uh, civilian protesters being shot by snipers are now filled with parading young Ukrainians who are going to be soon shipped, shipped off to, to war, shipped back to war um, in a very small but yet critical part of Ukraine's eastern territory, a war that they uh, didn't expect and, and didn't want. Um, so I, I think there's a kind of palpable shock here, um, but it is coupled with, I think, a growing um, defiance in the face of uh, uh, Russian aggression and interference. And, and Rory, I mean, the Russian trucks have entered Western Ukraine. We've heard them reporting some of them are actually leaving without government consent. And as we've been reporting here, this is widely being condemned by the West. But how much of this is, is in, this news is a boost to Putin standing at home? Do you think? Uh, that's a really good question. I mean, first of all, um, the, the humanitarian crisis in the territory controlled by armed bands under the patronage of the Russian Federation is indeed horrific. Um, I've spent very important times in my own life um, in, in Luhansk with students and, and, and friends, and, and what has happened in the region is nothing uh, short of a nightmare. nightmare. Um, nothing should distract us from this reality, and, and we should be supporting and allowing um, the activity of international third parties like the Red Cross, the UN Refugee Agency, and the like to do what they do best, and that is to tend to uh, civilians caught in the crossfire uh, without taking sides. Um, uh, but a state um, that is offering aid while at the same time supplying and supporting armed forces that are contributing and fomenting this violence that is affecting civilians um, uh, cannot be taken in good faith. And a state that is forcing across uh, another state's sovereign border, uh, 227 um, trucks cannot be taken uh, in good faith either. And I think um, the manner in which um, the convoy was put together uh, military trucks with white tarpaulin, painted white, the manner in which um, this uh, convoy very publicly made its way from Moscow um, to the border with Ukraine, the very manner in which it made this incursion yesterday across uh, Ukraine's sovereign border um, in contravention of agreements previously made with the Red Cross on the Ukrainian side. All of this, I suspect, means that aid is not the central objective of this convoy. It could be the secondary, tertiary objective, but I think the main objective here is uh, to make a PR presentation for Russian audiences who understandably want to see uh, the government acting benevolently here, which it is not, um, and to uh, uh, stunt the advances of the Ukrainian military, um, which has begun to surround Donetsk and Luhansk, um, sending and scattering 227 very pre uh, visible white trucks in a highly circumscribed and very active war zone is uh, highly obstructive and, and very dangerous. What we have Interesting uh, scene there. So what's really going on here? Well, let's bring in Rory Fennin. He's the director of Ukrainian studies at the University of Cambridge. As you see on your, your screens, he joins us now live from London. Good morning, Rory. Thanks for being with us. You, you know, you say that this covert invasion has been underway for months. But if you listen to Samantha Power there and the U.S. president yesterday, the U.S. being much more um, verbal in saying that Russia's behind this. So what's different now? And how much longer can Russia seriously deny it's playing any role? Well, uh, from the moment that um, Russian special, special forces and airborne units popped up in Crimea in February, um, it's safe to say that Russia has been waging a war of aggression against the Ukrainian state. This war has been military, informational, economic, and political. Um, what we're seeing now, these reports of at least a thousand regular Russian troops without insignia in southeastern Ukraine, 
um, is very clearly an invasion, um, but it's only really the latest in a, an invasion, as it were, by installments that's been occurring for, for months. We've seen mm. for these months um, columns of tanks, um, uh, scores of irregular fighters from Chechnya, the Russian Federation, uh, again, regular Russian soldiers slipping across uh, a, a porous part of the Russian-Ukrainian border, about 100 kilometers, that the Ukrainian state does not uh, control. Um, and what I think is quite uh, disturbing now is that essentially this invasion um, is more overt. It seems as though uh, the Kremlin has decided to pursue a worst-case scenario. Essentially, um, it is seen that its geopolitical goals have not been achieved by way of stealth and deception, um, not been achieved by inflating and sponsoring a, what had been a very marginal separatist movement. Um, so now it is openly using uh, regular Russian forces and openly risking the lives of Russian soldiers and, uh, in fact, the backlash back home. And so let's talk about the strategy then. I mean, we're also hearing reports from the relatives of these Russian soldiers saying, look, we want to know where our sons are and when they'll be home. Again, Moscow denying it's playing any role in all of this. But um, let's talk strategy. You know, where the Russian forces are now believed um, to have moved into outside of the eastern strongholds of this, this area along Ukraine's um, southern edge, uh, along the um, Azov Sea. What's the strategy there? Why does Russia want to be there? And what does that tell us? On the map, we're seeing an orange area of the eastern strongholds, um, and I'm, I'm speaking of the places that's just behind that blue banner where Russian forces are believed to uh, be now. What's the strategy there, Rory? This, this is a critical question, uh, because if these reports are true and Russian forces are advancing toward the Azov Sea coast, that is away from, as you say, Donetsk and Luhansk, where... Uh, uh, most of the armed, uh, armed conflict has been concentrated over the past months, um, then it more or less exposes and debunks a central myth that's been advanced by uh, Russian uh, Kremlin propaganda for quite a while, and that is that the Russian Federation is somehow supporting and protecting Russian speakers um, in uh, Ukraine who are under threat by the Kiev government. Outside of the fact that this is an absurd narrative, um, Ukrainians all over the country, east, west, north and south speak Russian. Uh, there's never been a demonstrable threat to Russian speakers in the country. Aside from this absurdity, uh, the cities on most of the cities on the Azov coast are peaceful. Uh, there is no fighting in Mariupol, for instance, uh, where hundreds, if not thousands, of Ukrainians took to the streets yesterday uh, to protest Russian aggression, uh, brandishing banners uh, that said Putin het, Putin uh, out or uh, get out, um, as well as other things I can't say uh, on television. Mm. Um, so this movement uh, should be uh, very closely watched by us because it essentially means that Russian troops will be uh, introducing war to in innocent Ukrainian civilians, and they'll be doing so, and this is the tr strategic question once more, they'll be doing so more or less out of naked strategic interest, even greed. They're, they're seeking, perhaps, um, to establish a land link with Crimea. This is very critical for the supply of electricity and water to the peninsula. Mm. Um, and they're also doing it to seize uh, the geopolitical and natural resources there. But Rory, let's spin out that point a bit more because the U.S. and, and European powers have tried to use sanctions as a way of uh, deterring Russia from continuing to do what it's doing now. So, you know, if you say that there's no humanitarian reason for Russia to get in there and save Russian-speaking people, why is Vladimir Putin doing this despite the sanctions and despite the international alienation? I mean, what's, what's this really about? I go back to what I originally said. Uh, the, the Kremlin has a guiding geopolitical objective here, and that is to ensure that Ukraine does not pursue a European path in its current form, that it not exercise its independence and sovereignty. But isn't uh, it the pushing Kremlin the country closer to Europe by doing this? Well, absolutely. That's an unintended consequence, and mm. that's a symptom of a repeated and very habitual misinterpretation, misapprehension of Ukraine and the Ukrainian people by the Kremlin and by many people in the West who have often uh, discounted Ukrainian national identity, who have reduced the country to a division between pro-Russian and pro-EU pro parts. This is a fiction. Um, so you're exactly right that national identity is being consolidated and expressed in, in powerful new ways. Um, but essentially, this European project is the very reason why we should be very active in supporting Ukraine at the moment. We cannot abandon this country uh, to an aggressor that's seeking uh, to wage war simply because it can. Um, and you mentioned sanctions. A lot of new ideas are needed 
the Ukrainian president Petro Poroshenko yesterday suggested uh, another one, and that is that the U.S. and specifically Barack Obama um, uh, offer Ukraine a major non-NATO ally status, which would accord uh, Ukraine a, a permission for um, uh, the acquisition or the use of U.S. financing for the procur procurement and purchase of uh, defense equipment, for instance. So mm -hmm. we need to be more creative outside of sanctions. This, this, th this threat is very grave. We need to take it very seriously. There you have it, Rory Finnan saying this is no time to abandon Ukraine, the Director of Ukrainian Studies at the University of Cambridge. Really appreciate you speaking with us this morning live from London. Thank